another uh, criminal defence lawyer who has upset, I think, uh, probably just about every authority, um, left or right, doing her job um, over her career. Sometimes I've been on the opposite side of uh, Marie, um, our next guest, um, on political issues and social issues of the day. But I've always respected her fierce intellect um, and her desire to do her best for the people that she represents, irrespective of the background that they come from. And she joins us on the show now. Marie, welcome to the show. Great to have you on. Good morning, Michael. You've been around a while. How long have you been doing criminal uh, defence work? Uh, I'm well into, um, I think I was admitted in 1982, late student, so that... Um, Pretty much about 41 years. Yeah, oh, okay. And you, why did you go into criminal defence? Did you choose that or did it choose yeah, you? No, I did. Always wanted criminal defence. Uh, coming from that good old Catholic uh, working class background and an era where, of course, uh, women could never aspire really to be lawyers, not from where I came from. But I always, even at high school, just loved anything to do with the courtroom, with dramas, but always from the defence perspective. And I was always the one, of course, saving the poor defendant from the gallows, and, and, um, but never dreamed I could make it. Did you watch Perry Mason? Oh, gosh, yes, never-ending, you know, those wonderful Perry Mason moments. Um, I'd love to see some of the old shows again, just just see how they are. They're on but now, actually, Marie. It. They're on... Um, oh, great. Yeah, um, I tape them. I think they play every, They play a new show every... They do it, it started in 1957, I think. They went through to 61. But you can actually yes. watch them now. It's on... Um, what's that channel that um, does all the old-fashioned ones? No, not Duke. Um, oh, oh, somebody I'll will tell find me. it because I'll, yeah. yes, I'll just put it in and, yeah. and Google oh. it. And of course, I never missed a, um, a Law and Order program, which that I was very thought good was too. a very high class program. Yeah. yeah, it was outstanding. And at times, the prosecution lost. You know, so that made it um, believable. They didn't always win. Yeah, that was a but great. But that program. was um, an outstanding program. Oh, by the way, welcome. Um, congratulations on your KC um, King's Thank Council. You. When did you get there? 2014. Oh, well, I mean, seriously, it's a big deal. So you're a QC and now you're a KC. Indeed. Not to be mixed up with the um, King Cobra gang up here. <laughs> Austin, although we do have our own hand signal. <laughs> but you're right, Mike. I, um, I wasn't going to apply. I thought they'd never make me, you know. Because yeah, I that's right. Because I out with yeah. so many um, of the establishment groups. And it's amazing um, where I am, uh, what groups I'm a consultant on. But always as a defence lawyer. Uh, right. Um, now, the other and, thing. And I get, yeah. Do you get paid more as a KC? You do. You can I charge get, more, can't you? Yes, you can. You can, but in criminal, um, yeah, it's not like the. I think it means more to commercial. I think they can charge a lot more. But I think what we find is that when the people do come to us and we do sometimes have to give them news that uh, they don't want to hear or they want to run a trial with their own strategy and we have to say, that's not going to work, I'm the one you need to listen to, they definitely listen to us. And I think when we go to court, uh, the, the good thing is when we do talk, uh, they listen. The judges listen, um, prosecution listen, your clients listen. And I think that's, that's a really important part of it. Marie, tell me something that um, has always struck me as a bit odd, and I'm sure there's a legal reason for it, but just in terms of a justice reason. Why do the defendants in criminal cases very rarely appear in the dock, um, giving evidence and being cross-examined? Well, there's, there's, that's a really, really good sort of strategy. If the Crown elect not to play any interview uh, that they've done with the police, and that's obviously, you know, obviously uh, videotaped, if they choose not to do that, uh, then you still have to weigh up because the onus is on the Crown. And the real danger that um, will c come in trials, particularly if they're trials where it's a he said, she said, then it becomes a contest between the two. Whereas the focus should be on what is the evidence that the Crown have? Uh, can they make the burden? So it's not often you would call someone where 
you would have no option but to call them. Things like self-defense, you'd always want to call them and, um, and because that's part of what was in their mind. But the danger always is you put somebody in a box, they might try very hard to get things right, but they might become subject to the same failures in giving evidence such as memory and consistency and then suddenly uh, that's it, you know, they, they plummet down. So it's not often you'll put them in the box, mainly because one, the onus is on the Crown and two, you don't want to undermine the gains that you've already made by undermining uh, the Crown case. The Crown's case, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, you're also, um, well, you've, you've seen a lot of trials. I guess you're following, are you, the Lauren Dickerson case because not only so interesting um, and so tragic, but also, I guess, because there are implications, you'd think, from the jury result uh, for future criminal cases too, yeah? Yes, there, there is. And quite often, when you have the insanity, uh, in vertical, insanity type defence, including, you know, the postpartum um, defences, Quite often, it not doesn't become a contest. The symptoms are for both, because, for example, the process is: I have a client. I'm on the defence side of things. I get um, an expert. It might be one or two. They are psychiatrists. They come back with an opinion as to whether the insanity defence is available. We then give that opinion to the Crown. The Crown then instruct their own expert, and that expert has the same access, of course, to um, the evidence that we have and the medical notes and all the rest. And generally, it, there's agreement. Right. But it's not often. But when there is a conflict where the Crown, and I've had... I've had cases where there is a conflict, then it becomes a question of the defence team and the uh, prosecution team, and it's for the jury to decide whether or not, you know, on the balance of probabilities, they accept the um, defence. Well, that's the extraordinary thing about this case in Christchurch, because uh, as Justice Manda said in his summing up, most criminal cases are about being able to sift through the facts and be able to find out what the facts are and then make a decision based upon the facts. In this case, you are making a decision based upon the competing opinions of the psychiatrists and psychologists, mm -hmm. of the defence and the prosecution. Marie, that's an almost an impossible task, I'd argue, for 12 laymen, isn't it? Well, in reality, when you're actually in the courtroom, Michael, it works out it's not because a lot of the facts uh, will be not contested. And then what the experts do is they use one as the facts to support their case, to say, well, you know, in this particular circumstance, the way somebody responded, the way they reacted, the sorts of things that they were saying uh, in this particular case, uh, supported a level of depression mm. that allowed you the insanity defence. Often the facts get settled and they're not really a lot in dispute. It's what the experts say they make of those. And these days, the experts, they don't get bound up in a whole lot of gobbledygook. They might say something that is uh, quite professional and you say, and then they'll say, now what that means is this, and I find that the experts today make themselves understood a lot better, and the judges will also say, well, you might need to explain what does that term mean, what does that condition mean, when you talk about things that the medical profession will know about, but the layperson won't. So it then becomes a question of, what will a jury make of those facts? Do they think that certain things that were said by somebody who's running the defence, uh, do, does that support whichever side? Do I accept that? And it is, it's, gonna, it's tough on a, a jury because what mm. you're looking at in this particular case is you've got to really battle against prejudice and sympathy. And you've also got to make sure that you don't 
um, get bogged down and fall into the trap of myths. You know, the back in the 60s and the 70s, you know, if people, they be serial killers when they would look at that and say, oh, you must have been mad to kill all those people. Those days have got, you know, they're gone and they've got to be put to one side. So that, um, and, and the thing that the jury will also be battling with is they may feel sympathy, you know, for the mum. They may feel prejudice, you know, for the mum. And they may think, well, I would have got help uh, much sooner. But sometimes, say, for example, with postpartum, you don't always uh, find the literature and the science tells you it's, it's seeing that you're suffering this sort of depression to a level where it actually becomes a defensive insanity. And, of course, the insanity is a lot easier because you can point to these delusions that somebody may well have. They may have these delusions that you, um, the person that you are killing might be somebody very close to you, but they represent the devil mm. and their task is to kill you. So those are the easier ones. Mm. Um, and the people who are suffering those mental disorders to that degree, of course they don't recognize that they have psychosis. So they're not going to go out and get help. If somebody is suffering postpartum depression to the level that it can be put forward as a defense, whether or not the jury accepts it or not, then it's not always easy to recognize those symptoms. But that's what the jury will be tangling with, is that this is what the experts say, um, whether or not there is psychosis or not, and the judge will have clarified that. And then they need to apply, in this case, the facts of this case to see whether they are, you know, the, whether or not they they have made out the defence for either in you know, sanity or postpartum, because postpartum is a form of course, of insanity. Is it? So, oh, sorry, I always thought postpartum, can you correct me on that one? Postpartum depression was a kind of depression. L numbers of women yes, uh, suffer is, from but that, but they don't kill their children. Well, the postpartum um, as a mental illness, it's the basis of an insanity <coughs> defence where someone, uh, the mum, of course, is charged with the murder or manslaughter of her infant. And it will only, you will only be able to have met postpartum depression defence if it also qualifies as the legal test of insanity. So you have to apply the insanity defence. One is, um, um, is it a psychosis? In this particular case, did the uh, person suffering or running the defence think that, um, you know, she was morally uh, right to have carried out the uh, murder or manslaughter. So it is definitely a, a type of um, insanity defence. Okay. Um, and and the pretty other side... Strict. It's pretty high. It's a, it's it's a, it, it's a high barrier, is it? Because I'm... I'm, I'm it is. It, okay. All right. And, and the and Justice Manda will have made that clear to the jury? Yes. And of course, um, it's no, you can't just say simply that I've had these certain psychological um, changes in childbirth. That's not enough. You still have to look at the facts and the uh, and the illness of each person who runs that defence to to absolutely make sure you've met that very high strict test of insanity. All right. Now, on the other side. You, the prosecution, the Crown in this particular case, they'll be arguing that she was aware or she was sufficiently aware of right and wrong, the concepts of when she committed her act. Is, is that where they're coming from? Yeah, well, that, that is part of the, in, of the insanity defence. And, of course, um, you definitely have to um, um, look at the facts of the case uh, as far as, um, in, you know, in any particular case, to say in those circumstances, did she um, think that she was morally right to actually take the life um, of the children um, in this particular case? 
So therefore, um, so far as you know, New Zealand is concerned, uh, again, they will look to see whether or not um, that the act of taking the life of the children uh, is um, to ha has met the requisite time is that um, that the, at the time she did think it was the right thing to do. Marie, have you followed so, this case yourself? Are you? I mean, you've been look, looking at the media reports. You probably have got much more insight than the rest of us, given your background. But have you been following it yourself? Yes, I have. I ha um, and I think for a lot of us um, that in terms of. Uh, what the outcome will be uh, it's like like always it's a it's a defense that you have to be on the lookout for uh, it absolutely is something that you must um, if you've got somebody if you've got a woman who comes for you and they have um, killed their children uh, you must look to see whether or not she uh, is someone who should not be held uh, fully responsible for uh, the murder or manslaughter uh, because her mind was so disturbed from the effects of childbirth or you know any disorder um, arising out of childbirth. Can I ask a question here? Um, and it relates to there was evidence given, and you would have seen that as well, that uh, Lauren Dickerson was severely disturbed and. Um, under medical care and receiving medication prior to coming out here and that she was concerned that that may stop her from getting permanent residence in here. That was one of the prosecution themes. She then took herself off medication. Um, I don't know why, but possibly because she thought she was fine, possibly because she wanted to convince others that um, um, she, was, she was fine to, to get permanent residence in this country. When you take yourself off medication, and I'm thinking for general crimes, whether they're drink driving or anything, um, it, or, it, you know, any crime that you might commit, are you held responsible even though you might end up psychotic as a consequence of having made that decision? Yes, but then what um, we find with a lot of people who become unwell, uh, in just in terms of insanity or... Of course, um, in you know the postpartum, um, then you you have to look and 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 say, well, why did they take themselves off medication? So that is a factor that they will look at. But a lot of people who become unwell, uh, then it's because they don't want to be on the medication. They don't think they need it, and this is why it is uh, so difficult in the system in the, in the country today is that we find that the people we deal with and it's insanity, uh, then it's because they, for some reason, have taken themselves off the medication, yeah. but they have been unwell when they've done it. They've thought it's all right, or they've forgotten, is, uh, they've forgotten to take it, or they feel so... Um, out of sorts, being on the medication, they think they can deal with it. So is there a correlation, so you've made, if you've made that rational decision to go off and the consequences yes. you, you are... Think you're at a, you or you yeah, think at, you're rational. Or you think you're rational and yes. you make that decision yes. to go off and the consequences you have a psychotic episode in which you commit a crime. That's right, that's right. Then does the, does the insanity defence still work despite the fact that it, it was your decision that led to that outcome? Well, that's just one of the factors uh, that you will take into account to decide uh, w whether or not, in deciding whether or not she was thought she's morally right or wrong, that the jury will be grappling with. They will be turning that over. But just because you take yourself off medication uh, doesn't mean to say, therefore, you are now criminally responsible because you do it when you are suffering from maybe um, the onset of psychosis, the onset of deep depression, and therefore your mind is also becomes distorted. Uh, and then that is why you then take yourself off the medication. It will all be a factual matter that will have come out. In your experience, the gender of juries in cases like this, does it matter? 
whether or not it's a conscious decision. Well, no, we whether or be. not. Well, yeah. Um, is, 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 well, you, you mentioned rightly, and I think the, the sort of prejudice sympathy argument, like I've walked in with a prejudice because you did it, or, you know, I'm sympathetic because you did it. So you walk in with well, those. Yes. Uh, do, do women walk in or men walk into a jury in your experience um, slightly more sympathetic or prejudiced depending upon their gender? Oh, I think juries come in and they bring all sorts of personal uh, prejudices with them. And I don't say that necessarily in a bad way, mm. but they come in with their views. They may come in with certain religious views. They may come in and say, well, I wouldn't do that because of. But you tease all that out during the jury trial system. And I find that that jur jurors, I mean, you're going to get some jur juries that um, jurors don't act responsibly, but mostly they do. And they're definitely warned by all the lawyers and the judge you must not bring those sorts of views that are not lawful into your deliberations. You must look at the evidence. You must listen. That's what Justice Mander will be saying. You must listen to what I say the law is. You decide the facts. The judge helps them with the law. And then by the end of it, usually those um, preconceived, I think is a better way, these preconceived notions of what you would do in a particular circumstance, they're often gone. They've been teased out. Mm, okay. Now, um, and, uh, and juries are capable of doing that. Yes. I find they are. Justice Manda, though, has also listened to the evidence. He is, mm. as obviously, a skilled um, justicia. Uh, he has been a yes. lawyer himself. He will be at mm. that level. Will he have in your experience, his own views as to guilt or innocence in this matter? He may well have, because um, uh, he may feel, you know, when the verdict comes out, he may quietly sort of think, yes, I can understand why they've come to that. But when you have, like, say for me as a defence lawyer, I know that a lot of people will say, how do, you, how do you not wonder about whether they're guilty or innocent? And I say, it's easy. I just don't go there. Um, I look at the evidence. I am absolutely, totally evidence-based. And if um, Justice Manda has a, a view for himself, it will be evidence-based. He will think, I can understand why the jury came to that verdict. I can understand based on the evidence. Um, they, a judge may well think, wow, that's a surprise. I think that's a harsh decision or that's a lenient decision. They may have those sorts of views, but it won't be based on their own personal um, um, ideas of what should be and shouldn't. And all of us are very, um, very well able over the years of experience to put whether we have a personal view to one side, we absolutely look at uh, whether or not the evidence backs up what it is. And that's what we all do. That's certainly what I do. I will look at the evidence and that's what I work on. But I never go into there and say, oh, I wonder if she's guilty or I wonder if she's guilty. I don't go there. And I actually am able to do that without any difficulty at all. And of course, what this trial is all about is that based on uh, what the evidence tells the jury, what they find as a fact, is this person, is uh, Mrs. Dickinson, is she criminally liable for what she did? And of course, there's four options available for her. She could be found guilty of murder, Mm -hmm. where they have found is that, no, she doesn't reach that high level. Uh, the other one could be that she's maybe guilty of uh, the lesser alternative charge of infanticide. Yeah. Um, may well be um, the act of murder is proven, but not guilty by reason of insanity, and that's the more common one. Postpartum is incredibly rare, but you see, she could have the act of infanticide proven, but not guilty by reason of insanity. So while it sounds really complex and tricky, it will have been very well um, explained by all those parties. And they'll come back with any 
questions or queries to say, look, help us out. And the juries are able to ask the judge questions and the judge can answer those questions during the course of the trial. So it's all going to come down to what at the time that she took the lives of her children, what really was her mental state in law. And as I say, is the people need to um, not, you know, the public need not to worry and say, well, this is going to open a door to all sorts of women coming and saying, I'm not responsible because I suffered the postpartum blues. Uh, it's a... You don't, it's not often you're able to run that defence. It's a very complex defence uh, and you really do have to qualify for all the symptoms uh, based on the law and based on the medical uh, field because even the medical experts will say uh, you can su suffer postpartum blues, but to what level? You might have a low level of postpartum postpartum blues, but it's not going to drive you to commit no. the act of taking someone's life or, which, or which, your child's life. Yeah, which is fairly obvious in New Zealand because most people, yeah. as you say, who suffer don't. Um, and finally, um, Marie, I'm, I'm interested in the reporting of this trial. Um, I've mm -hmm. followed it pretty assiduously. Um, as you know, I have a particular, oh, I don't know, an emotional reaction to children who are killed or maimed in this country, and I have for a very long time. So this just, and as anybody who's got children, I know you have as well, and grandchildren too, um, I think most people who do have children or grandchildren, certainly of this age, um, there will be a, a shudder go through them when the news first became apparent. But I'm not, I, so I've, I've listened, to, I've watched the media coverage. I, I particularly, um, stuff have a reporter there that have been on a daily basis reporting every 10 to 15 minutes about evidence that's before there. In your view, do you think that in this case, the media have been responsible in their reporting of it? And in your experience, do you think that we know enough information to come to our own conclusions? I think it's actually a case where I think the reporting has been responsible and I'm someone who's always on, you know, red flag alert um, and my default position is um, that, that, that the media look to sensationalise and so forth. But I think in this particular case, I'm sure Justice Banda has, has given directions to the media. I think it has been responsible, but I think it's a very important case for the public, which whatever the outcome is going to be, you know, for the defendant, that they've been able to understand what's involved. And I think it's an important decision for the public to be aware that there are difficulties out there in society people are suffering from psychosis and insanity they're not getting the treatment and the recognition that they should be getting out there and within their own families they should know that they can come forward to the authorities to the medical authorities and say look i can see this is happening to somebody in my family uh, do not judge me, do not judge these people, but we have to be able to uh, improve the mental health system and the Mental Health Act so that they can step forward, say, I want my loved one or, or somebody I'm close to to be looked after to get the treatment, but often it's so hard to get treatment uh, for people as well. Yeah, I sort of understand that in most cases, symptoms. but but in this case yeah. we're dealing with, with clinicians of a high order, a high yes. IQ, high experience, uh, medical background. Yeah, would have thought that, well, have I got it wrong? I, I The people that you're talking about, I totally agree with you, Marie, our mental health systems in crisis. I walk over people or walk through people or around people in Wellington over the last four days mm -hmm. and I can see that for itself. That is, and nobody seems to give us stuff about them. Um, mm -mm. But yeah. having said that, in this particular case, we're talking about two health professionals. Does that change some of your thoughts on that? I mean, if they don't know, who the hell does? Well, that's, as I say, that's an interesting question. But you and I, Michael, both know 
if I like say for example if I have a client and they're charged with um, killing their children or, or killing you know a child and stuff like that I can I can honestly represent them objectively with no problem at all no judgment but like you when I read the cases of children and you see these photos of these lovely smiling children what dreadful treatments happen to them where they've been so abused and they've ended up dead or seriously ill um, we just cry we cry and we are in despair because mm. we know that it's going to hit mm. the public conscience but then it all disappears again what is really being done to really intervene identify children at risk to intervene to break open the what is referred to as the cone of silent to provide the resources and the powers for qualified people to intervene in these situations and save these children and you and i both know that it just goes on and it, it breaks our it heart. does it does and it, it is breaks our heart it is and it's a stain upon our country and it continues to this day it is we yep we have a unacceptably high level of abuse of children in new zealand and i'm stepping away from those um who um will fall into the you know the mentally disordered you know the depression those but generally there are so many cases where none of these defenses or none of these circumstances exist mm. and they the treatment of children is just is abhorrent it's torture and we should be ashamed because it shouldn't be happening in new zealand and we're right up there we are really a nation that has such a high level of this kind of abuse and these poor little children they have no defense Correct. They can't defend themselves. Marie, you are so right. Listen, it's been an absolute yes. pleasure to talk to you, to gain an insight. Um, your intellect stands out and your compassion as well. Um, I guess we'll be both looking for that verdict. We, we, we all are. We're yeah. all, we're all um, and whatever it is, Michael, as you and I both know, whatever that verdict, that outcome is, nobody is a winner in this case. It's a tragedy for every single person involved. So right. Thank you so much, Marie. Thanks, Michael. No, okay, thanks you, a lot. you have a very good week. Thank you so much. Uh, there's Marie Dryberg. Um, Dryberg, she is the King's Counsel. She's also, I think, President of the Auckland Legal Society. I hope you are better informed as a consequence of that as to what the jury has to decide. Um, yeah, because that lady has been arguing that defence, but her final remarks there, spot on. Um, it's a stain on our country. It remains so. It has been for now decades, and no one is doing anything about it. It isn't an issue this coming election. No parties are talking about it. We'll continue to see children killed, maimed, hurt, harmed, and nobody seems to care.